Hello. So uh, when Horace asked me to um, have a look at our final keynote speaker's bio on paper, I was just floored. Um, and I thought, how can I possibly uh, introduce Rita Khan? How can I possibly have anything to discuss with her because she's just so incredible, which she is. And um, we're very fortunate to have you today, so thank you for coming. It comes on by itself. Um, but last night I had an opportunity to actually meet her. And I didn't know who she was in the room. We had a dinner. And uh, the reason I didn't know was because though her bio, and I, I think I can say that this is a uh, pretty common characteristic of all of our entrepreneurs who, and speakers who have been here on this stage today, they're all very humble. And um, it's just so impressive to see that on paper, it's a very different story from the modest personalities that come to the stage today. But that being said, I, I want to introduce Rita. She is extremely impressive, and I, I will let her tell you her story and how she went from finance to fashion and lifestyle to media, how she's given back to the community, how she's managed to do all of that and still have a work-life balance, and um, done everything that we've talked about today. Rita? Thank you so much. Is this working now? It is. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. It's actually my pleasure to be here. Um, I, st I was born in southern Punjab. I moved to Chicago when I, was, uh, when I just turned 17. I went to college here. And, uh, you know, like I think most people, I was very confused as in what should I pursue? And um, I wanted to be a physician. I think that is uh, something that, uh, that I wanted to be and uh, that I was good at. I was always good at math and science. Uh, I thought that I was creative, but I, I used to hate art. Um, and I don't know why. I think maybe it was the art teacher. Um, and uh, my mom was a teacher in the same school in Pakistan, and uh, my art teachers would always ask me, D did you bring your art book? And I just wouldn't bring the art book in. And I don't know if it was just because she kept on asking, and you know, it was just my thing where, no, if that's what you want, I'm just not gonna give it to you. I don't know if it was that or what it was, um, but I, I just, would not bring in the art book. And she was an old woman um, and, and very crabby as well. Um, I feel bad for her now. I wish that uh, I had the ability to, uh, to listen to her more and, and my teachers more. But uh, you know, there's just certain personalities, I guess, and, and, and you learn as you grow. Um, you learn to, to respect your teachers, and I advise everyone to do that um, as well. But anyhow, she would. I think she walked and she climbed five floors uh, one day just to go over and tell to my mom that, you know, your daughter doesn't bring art uh, book. And then the next day she asked me, she's like, do you have your art book now? I think she was expecting my mom to just, you know, really scold me and be very angry at me. Um, I don't even think my mom told me um, that she came over. And my mom's actually sitting right there. That's why I keep on looking at her. Hi, mom. Um, and dad, dad somewhere there too, I don't see him. Yeah, he's there. So, you know, it was, it was quite a journey. I think I was always very overconfident. Um, confidence, yes, but overconfidence is never good. So, you know, always keep that balance. If I may, um, she's saying she's confident, but I really have to and says she's humble. Yes. I mean, we have someone here who started out at Morgan Stanley and now she runs Sinclair Broadcasting, which controls more than 450 TV station fashion and lifestyle. I mean, she owns a holding company that, if you know anything about fashion, David Yurman Jewelry is one of her brands. I mean, um, confident, but very <laughs> humble. <laughs> Thank and you. And I hear a lot of stories about people who have never worked for anybody else and 
I don't anymore either, which is fantastic. But you know, you've done both of those things. And yes. so I think that there's a lot that we can learn from you and including how you actually found out that you are creative to get to where you are. You know, I came here and I was again confused with, with medicine and, and then I'm figuring out maybe law and I didn't want to disappoint my parents because, you know, they really, they, they, they placed a lot of their trust in us and they wanted us to become something. Uh, they of course immigrated here because of us as well and, and, and hoping that we would, we would have bright futures here. Um, well, it was difficult. You know, going to college here is difficult. Um, we weren't really prepared. I don't think we were planning on moving. So I really had no clue about SATs, but I still gave them because I, I, I was really under a time crunch, so I had to give them in the summers that I came. Um, and I ended up in college, thankfully, um, in a good college. And it was, I think maybe that was one of the mistakes that I made. I should have gotten to a college if I wanted to be a doctor, something that's not very competitive. Um, and then I, I, I kept biology as my major, which was just too boring for me. Um, it was, I couldn't even stand the bio labs. I mean, you're sitting and you're just, and I know that you've worked in a lab for 10 years, but you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but you're sitting and you're just looking at the gels the whole semester, like four months, and you're just measuring like how, how much centimeter, I mean, not even centimeter, like what millimeter did that thing move? And I was just like, you know, the, this is so painfully slow for me. You know, at least in chemistry, something happens. You know, you put in two chemicals and there's a fire or there's, you know, something that, that happens. And it's like, whoa, okay, you know, let's move on. It's just, it was just so much quicker. But biology was just painful. And then I'm thinking, you know, how do I break it to my parents without disappointing them that, you know, I just really don't think I can handle biology or anything related to health sciences at all for the next next eight years and for the rest of my life. I just don't think that I'd be good at it. And, um, you know, it took my parents, I guess, some time to get used to it. And then I told them, well, maybe I'll do law, mom. You know, I mean, let me do business management um, and finance. Um, finance, just because as a Desi, I think you have to have some math element in whatever you do. And finance is, you know, people get it. Okay, wh wh what are you studying? Finance, oh, okay. Uh, what are you studying? Engineering, oh, okay. What are you studying? Medicine, okay. Law, okay. But, you know, the minute you say business management, I think people kind of think that you're a loser and you just kind of get lost amongst the others. Okay, maybe she's still figuring out what you want to do. Um, I think changing it to business management was, it was broad enough for me. Um, and I had a finance minor because that was all that they offered. They didn't offer a major. Um, but I learned a lot. I learned, and as I grew older, I learned a lot about myself. I did not realize that I was creative um, in college. My creative streak, I, I realized when I was sitting in boardrooms with, for example, you know, Time Inc. COO, and, and we're just figuring out where exactly is digital going? Um, and how do we create compelling content? And that's where I think I came up with most ideas than even their team, and they're looking at me like, wow, you know, this is just fascinating. And I'm also like, wow, this is pretty fascinating. They're actually buying all the ideas that I'm telling them. And I haven't even thought of this. Who knew I could be creative? But I think as a Daisy, we're very creative. Uh, we just don't know it. And because, you know, I, I think we just overbear the other side, so we're always just excellent in math and science, and we just really take liberal arts and arts in general just so lightly, which I think is not fair. I mean, look at the fashion industry now in Pakistan, um, how much it has boomed. I mean, some of those things are so fabulous, it would really put I mean, fashion designers' hair to shame, but you know, and and the way they put things, the way their fashion shows are. I mean, it's it's a performance on its own. So we are very creative, and you know, if I look 15 years back, 20 years back, when I first came from Pakistan, we actually, you know, 
or maybe I wasn't into it, I was just 17, um, but I'm never into fashion designers per se in any case. Um, but there really was not much of a fashion industry. You know, I remember my mom after school would just take us to the tailor and we would just wait there and she would go choose buttons and, and things like that. But, uh, you know, it wasn't ready-made and, you know, designers, how they are now, that, that stuff was not there. But look at it now. I mean, within 20 years, that's how creative we are, you know? Why? Just because we just need someone to start doing it, and then we follow. And then we realize, wow, this is an industry we can make money in. And this is an industry that, you know, that would just be so great for, for me, or, you know, I can do it too, or my son can do it too, or my daughter can be do it too. So then you jumped from finance to realizing you were creative in a different way. Yes, yeah, so um, I jumped from finance actually very early on. Um, my education is finance, and I was at Morgan Stanley, and I just, you know, did not like it. I, I used to, I mean, I couldn't even spend time there after lunch. I mean, I just wanted to go to sleep. Like, I, 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 I think IT was probably watching, but I would just be playing, you know, Yahoo games, I think, half the time. And I'm like, you know, I, I can't do this. I can't, you know, maybe I just don't want to be a career woman. So let me just, you know, go and live, you know, find my Prince Charming and just have kids and, and live a life like that. Um, and I did that. I found my Prince Charming. Um, and I got married. Um, my husband's not here today. I wish he was. Um, and we and I had a son. And when I got married, my husband comes from a family where he's a physician. His mom's a physician there from Hyderabad, India, originally. He was born and raised here. And they come from a family where, you know, women are not just sitting at home. Women are working as well. Women are contributing to society. So it was very different. Not that my mom was a homemaker, but still, it was just a very different culture, which I think I was in, in, a, in culture shock for a good six months. But then I realized, well, you know, I've, I've gotten all this education, and it wasn't really easy for my parents to put me through college because they did it all on cash, and that was very hard for doing that for two kids uh, as immigrant parents. But, you know, they did it with big dreams and hopes for us. And, and you know, that's when I actually started, um, I was pregnant, so I knew I'm not really going to get any job. Um, and that's when I started importing bathrobes, actually, from Turkey. And we used to live with my in-laws in Oak Brook, and uh, um, I would really just be killing time on the computer and I was like, well, you know, maybe I'll just do bathrobes, you know, just get them in from Turkey and just 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 kind of go from there. And you know, now that I look back, everything just makes sense. You know, but that's life. When you look at your life looking back, it all makes sense. That's when you're like, oh, now I know why I had to learn this or why I had to learn that. It all makes sense. But when you're standing at that point looking forward, it's just like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I, I don't know what my life's really going to be like. And, but you just have to go with the flow. You really have to be like water, you know, it just finds its own way. You just can't put yourself in a box. You can't be like, well, you know, if this is what I want to be, that's it. You know, I studied to be, you know, I, I wasted four years studying finance. This is, you know, it has to be this or, or, or nothing. You have to pursue your passion. You have to pursue, you know, if you're working, you have to keep in mind your career is what you are going to be doing for the rest of your life, most of the rest of your life, more so than spending time with your spouse. So you have to be very careful how you choose it. And you can change it any time. It's just not easy when you change it. Well, I, I hear a common thread across all of the speakers' uh, comments, and um, it's that uh, whatever you're professional life is going to be, it's going to be that forever. But something does have to fall to the wayside. And I also heard a lot of comments about family. 
I wish I had spent more time with family. I wish I had an opportunity to spend more time with my children. You know, what suffers the most in your journey? I think I suffered the most in my journey um, because it is your sacrifice. It was uh, my sacrifice. Um, you know, my kids, I mean, yeah, they're with their nanny, but they're playing, you know. I mean, my son doesn't really even remember the time that I was in New York and he was with his grandma. I mean, you know, time goes by, but it is you that ends up suffering. Um, it is your guilt that just kind of, as a woman at least, you know, keeps on coming back to you where, oh my gosh, I wish I spent more time with with my family, with my with my parents. But you know, that's just life in general. I, I mean, I feel like no pain, no gain, so you do have to sacrifice. So you went from Turkish bathrobes to this huge holding company to Well, so media. From, from Turkish bathrobes, um, I actually, you know, because I used to be sitting, I'm a millennial, so I sit on the computer a lot, just, you know, browsing, and, and I think it's a curse being a millennial because it's, you, you, you just have, you're just doing 10 things at the same time, and you're just not really satisfied with either one, and you just want to do more and more and more and more, which, and even now, I mean, you know, I'm handling media, but at the same time, I'm handling, um, designs and buying and, and, and whatnot. Um, I don't think if I was, I still think I was born too quick. I think I should have been a Gen Z, um, but I'm, I'm on the other spectrum of millennial. Um, anyhow, coming back to the story, um, so from bathrobes, I actually went to Italian designers and French designers that were huge in Italy um, and Europe, but no one really had heard of them here. So I went and I made deals with them. Well, you know, let me let me help you out. Um, let me help you out here in United States um, with your with with press, with buying, with with wholesale orders. And for them, it was like, sure, let's do that. So I moved to New York, I opened a showroom, and I had a um, few great designers. And, um, you know, I think I got a few orders. I was doing their PR as well. PR uh, is public relations. Um, it's not really a term that uh, most Thaisies, um know or believe in, but it's actually a very, very interesting component um, in, in really doing business and doing anything, and that actually relates a lot to, to media. I see you laughing, <laughs> but, uh, but that's true. Um, it's very hard to really be successful unless you know how to market anything. Um, well, including yourself. Exactly, and that's where I was going to get to, where that's the number one thing that you should learn, which they don't really teach in college, is how to market yourself uh, without coming across as arrogant or without coming across as, you know, someone that's just stuck up or a show off. And that's very hard, but that's what you have to learn. And I feel like that's what I learned in my journey, is it's really not about your resume anymore, it's really about how you talk and the charisma that you have. But anyhow, now going back to, uh, to New York, um, so I moved there, uh, spent a lot of money, opened a showroom, and I was doing their PR as well. And then you know what happened? Then 2008 recession happened. Um, and people just stopped buying luxury brands. Uh, luxury was actually the, New York was the first market to get hit, and after that it kind of uh, uh, rolled over everywhere. But uh, New York City was the first one to get hit, and luxury was the second one to get hit. Um, actually, after finance, it was the other market that got hit. Uh, stores just stopped buying, and I actually had to, to close that business. Um, and my frustration in that business was, because for buying, you have to go to trade fairs, you have to go to trade shows. And this is not the technology industry in 2008. This is the fashion industry in 2008. Um, you know, Zara started e-commerce in 2013. So, you know, think about it from that perspective. We're, we're, we're talking about a company that's very technologically behind. Um, and my idea, that's when I came up with the idea, well, 
why do we have to wait for trade shows for buying to happen? Why can't it happen, you know, why can't there just be a platform where you can go online and this thing can happen 24 seven? Because, you know, trade shows, no one has enough time. If you've been to trade shows for apparel, I mean, it's, um, I think a million square feet, it's in three days. No one really is going to find you, best of luck. Um, so it's, it's really, you know, that's what I came up with. Uh, and then to drive traffic, I had to actually open another uh, platform that was free news for fashion industry. So, you know, free, sure, people love that then um, because it was the recession and everyone was cheap. So sure, you know, why would I pay WWD um, 100 bucks a year? Let me, just do, let me just go here and it's free. So I use that to kind of draw in the traffic for the industry. And then all of a sudden, it just worked. Both things worked. Um, and it was fabulous. I sold that, and that's kind of what really dragged me more towards media. And ever since I got married, my husband just knew, I don't know if it was um, because he was from India, I mean, his background, or if he, because, you know, Pakistanis don't really get it. I mean, media is like, okay, yeah, whatever. Um, it's not, we don't understand the power that media has and the impact that media has. I think now we do because we're getting to the stage where, yes, we're getting suppressed, um, because of the media, because no one is really there to tell your story. So you're relying on other people that don't know anything about you um, to tell your story. I mean, so anyways, sorry, I go all over. <laughs> well, well, we're here to hear about you. Um, have you found it challenging at all being a Pakistani in media or, I mean, I, I could say all of the things, Pakistani Muslim woman in media. You know, I, I learned the hard way. It was, it was not challenging in the media, and maybe that was because I learned to put it, to not make it the focus of myself. You know, I, I learned because the hard way, um, because I actually lost one of the companies that I represented when I was in fashion industry. And that was my beginning um, of my career in the fashion industry. And that was very, very, very hard for me. And I realized that, you know, there, there is, because fashion industry is, and again, this is nothing against anyone, but fashion industry is very Jewish dominated. Um, and you come across, you know, as a, a, things are now very different, but this is again back in 2008. And there are really no Muslim designers, no Muslim executives, um, no one to really give you any helping hand or to really even understand what you're going through. So, you know, this is back then, and it, and, and it was very hard for me because one of the companies um, actually ended up taking um, a major contract from me after receiving it, um, you know, because of the way that I was and because of my origin. And, um, you know, you just, you just live and learn. I mean, we live in a post-911 world. I mean, everything has changed. Um, and it, you know, it just, you just can't let it define you. You can't let it break you. There's going to be so many instances. Um, you just really have to learn to develop a thick skin and just shrug it and just move beyond it. You know, because now it's, now that I look back at it, it's, it's rather amusing. Um, but I realized the power of media then, that okay, because it was actually a small magazine that wrote a bad article about me, that they later pulled it, um, of course. But, you know, there's, there's a lot of dirty things that go on. And that happens more when you're at the bottom of the pool, because that's where all the critters are. Um, and, you know, that's where they'll, they'll just start taking you down. So you have to rise above that. When you're at a certain level, it's very hard for someone to take you down. But, but obviously, it was something that you needed to handle personally. It was very difficult. I mean, I was at a point where I wanted to shut everything and I just wanted to come back to Chicago because it's, you know, 
for me to face that, I, you know, I was just like, I just can't keep on doing this. And then the recession happened, and I was really at my at my lowest. But you did rise above it, as all good entrepreneurs do. You just yes. focus on your goal, and you believe in yourself, and you keep going. That's true. That's true. You I've, just really have to. I'd like to open it up to maybe just a couple of questions, because we don't have a lot of time. But if you have any questions. Thank you. Uh, you have talked about some constraints on the impact of, of uh, your time on your family and children. How, is, how did you solve it? You know, um, now, and actually even then, I think a lot of that is, is my personal issue. And I think that's just something that as a woman, um, I will just have to deal with it. Um, it's, and that's, I think, something that most working women will have to deal with. It's your time away from kids. Um, it balances out because your kids get busy as well once they start school. So now, I mean, you know, I stop working from six and six to nine until they go to bed. It's my time with my kids. You're welcome. Hi. Hi. So I appreciate that, but at that time, LA comes live, right? So you have to work with LA people at that time, and you're like, oh, and then all over the world. You know, no, I mean, now there was a point where I had to do that. Now it's really, you know, LA can wait. Right. So Rita, I have a question for you. Yes. You said Pakistani media isn't as progressive as Indian media is, and that's how you kind of got a platform. I disagree in a way because I feel like a lot of the news articles nowadays, especially like just giving you an example of like uh, Myra Khan right recently and how a media can media can break or make somebody. But aside from that, how would you now that you're at this platform and you're at a level where you can help Pakistani women get to where they can be you or empower them? Um, the one thing that Pakistan does have is poverty level and people that can actually stitch and sew and be a part of the fashion, uh, billions of dollars of fashion industry. So how can you empower them and solve the problem that you just told us about? And what is your, how do you envision changing that? You know, I, I can speak for the Pakistani American woman. Um, it's hard for me to speak for Pakistani woman from here, I'm not really sitting in Pakistan, so it's hard for me having kids as well. At this stage in my life, it's another thing when I'm around 50 and my kids are in college, for me to go to Pakistan and, and help and empower women there. But you know, for Pakistani American women, um, I think that there's that, you know, we're at a point where Pakistani American women need to help themselves. Um, they're very empowered. They, 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 they can go out, they can work, they can go out, they can write. Um, they choose not to. And I feel like that's a problem. That's a problem that we're facing. If you look at the Jewish community, um, their women are, are giving equal time to their, to their kids and families as well. Um, you don't necessarily have to work, but you're contributing to the society by maybe writing an article here or an article there that's, that then gets published um, maybe in Huffington Post, maybe in, in Washington Post. You know, we need to empower ourselves. We're educated. I mean, I have so many friends that are so highly educated. We, we just, we, we're just lazy. We just don't want to do it. So, you know, and it's, and it's very hard for just one person to be like, okay, let's do it, let's do it. I mean, we're not dealing with 18-year-olds, and I'm, I'm no one's teacher. You know, we all need to realize that this is a problem. If we don't fix this, I mean, it's a very big problem that we're looking at. You know, kids learn, and, and little girls, their, 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 their superhero is always their mom. You know, so, I mean, I look up, and I look at how much energy my mom has to this day. I mean, I tell her anything and, and she has more energy than I do. And that's my motivation because I've seen that. You know, I mean, I, I can't even sit and complain in front of my mom. Like something's just gonna start happening to her and she'll be like, okay, okay, you know, let's just talk about something else, just talk about something positive. Um, you know, so it's, 
it's, I think, you know, we need to change our mindset and we need to actually help ourselves because Pakistani women no longer, I mean, especially women here, no one's stopping them from doing anything. You know, they have equal education. I mean, we're in a mindset where they are empowered, but we just choose to be lazy. If, and that's wrong. If I may add a little, a little known fact about Rita is that in her free time, free time, when she's not working and, and actually seeing her children and, and spending five minutes of silence, um, she, she also gives back to the world through uh, helping the United Nations um, with her expertise in lifestyle and fashion. So maybe not in the Pakistani community, because maybe that's not what you're 100% familiar with, but in order to allow the people to help women, the poorer cultures um, all over the world, uh, Rita does give back to yes. uh, the world by working with the United Nations. Yes, I'm part of a charity organization called Fashion for Development, and that is uh, for all developing countries um, in the world that actually deals with Bangladesh and issues with clean water in India and Pakistan. Um, so I'm very involved. I do give back whenever I can. Um, and we also do a first lady's luncheon in New York every time there's uh, uh, every time UN is in session. And what that does is it's about platform, right? Your voice should be so strong. You should be sitting at a platform where when you have the mic, it makes a difference. So you know, every year, women first ladies of the world, um, of all the leaders of the world, um, they come in, they gather in a very intimate setting. And they, you know, that's where you have the podium. And this time, I mean, um, and this is not just first ladies, of course, with first ladies comes all the glitz and glamor and models. And, um, you know, Iman, the model, gave such an amazing speech about, you know, how this in this world, Muslims are just getting so oppressed. Um, did I tell her to do that? No. But, you know, you create a podium that is so powerful that, you know, no one can stop you from doing that. And no one is stopping anyone. You know, it's, we put ourselves in a box. We put ourselves in, in, in our own restrictions. You know, we are our biggest enemies. Well, um, obviously, we, we could talk all evening, but um, we, we need to wrap it up and allow everybody to network and, and move on. But Rita, thank you so much. Thank um, you for there. having me. It was my pleasure. We can learn so much from you. Thank you.